at AU Bank Samwad. Michael, you are at a literary festival, and a reader comes up to you and says, I didn't know of you, sir, but I heard that you're very famous, and I bought your book yesterday, and I read it through the day, and it's really good. <laughs> would you believe that? Would you like them? Would you trust them? Of course I would trust them. Um, yesterday, I was waiting to leave, and someone came out to me and talked about how in the English patient, when Kip's motorcycle goes off the bridge, he felt faint. And when he came out of the water, he felt great. And I think it's one of the nicest things I've ever heard about the English patient, you know, uh -huh. in this ma manic crowd that was there. Yeah, sure, I would happy to believe them. I don't always believe them, but. <laughs> the only reason why I ask that is it seems, uh, you know, uh, you can, there's some novels which you can pick up, or some novelists whom you can pick up, and um, uh, the, the, the general, ambience of the work merges with that of the wider world of fiction, so it's not no great hardship to pick up what they're about. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that in your books, uh, one is kind of schooled by the book itself and how to read it, and that takes a bit of work, and uh, even for those readers who are used to you, they're always kind of somewhat thrown off by what is going on, and so is it possible to read you that fast? Well, I, I think maybe that reflects how I write the book. You know, I mean, I, I, think, I, I'm, I think there are writers who are confident and there are writers who are doubtful. I'm one of the doubtful gang. And I think it's because I'm never sure when I begin a book, first of all, if it's gonna work, and secondly, what it's about. You know, I mean, some writers know exactly what they're gonna do and what the theme and so forth is and how they're gonna write it and how they're gonna structure it. And for me, I literally begin in a dark room. I literally do not know what the story is gonna be about. I just have some image the most obvious one being in the English patient, where a, a, a unnamed patient is talking to an unnamed nurse. And you know that was just the beginning of the book. And I thought, OK, I'll follow this. And then someone called Caravaggio turns up 20 pages later on, having a photograph of him taken. And so he comes into the story. And usually my books are a gradual party. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the, my early books were about Billy the Kid or Buddy Bolden, and there mm -hmm. was just one character. But yes. now, you know, there's a cast of characters who turn up. And then, where do I follow? How, how do they connect? And how does the story evolve out of these characters? Mm. So I think, you know, it, it is that thing of me also trying to find out how things are going to work together, you know, and mm. where it's taking place. Mm. When you say your books begin with an image, is the writing then about what is released by that image, or are you trying to find words for the image itself? I, I'm, I'm more interested in the image than the words for it. You know, obviously the words are gonna depict it as accurately as possible, mm. if that's what you mean. I mean, I, I think the image is like a little doorway into a story. Um, in another book, there are two sisters who live on a farm, and I, I had no idea what they looked like or who they were, but that's how it began. Mm. And I mean, this all sounds kind of absurdly casual, but it's not. I mean, I'm very tense when I'm writing the book. And, mm. and what usually happens when I finish that first draft is I go, have to go back and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite for a couple of years. So to try and balance the, mm. the unease, mm. perhaps. Mm. What I find, and I suspect I speak for almost every reader who's here today, uh, uh, very beautiful about your work is that uh, the, um, uh, the peculiar tempo of the sentences, and uh, there's so many writers whom you can read, and once you've got what they're saying, then you just move on. Mm -hmm. But uh, with you, it's possible just to start right up again at the top of the page and read the same thing t twice as three times over, and each time there's something new. So that must in involve some sort of work, and I was interested to know uh, how you came to your method. Um, let's see. Um, I, th I think that I, I am... I, I think I'm very conscious as a reader as well as a writer so that I don't want to bore myself, you know. So I think that it's like changing gears in a car as opposed to driving on automatic the whole time. And I'm very conscious of some writers who, you know, the voice in the first paragraph is exactly the same as the voice in the 30th page yes. and vice versa. So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious. And, and you know, because there are three or four people, and there are three or four narrators perhaps, 
Each one has a distinct voice. And I'm very interested in voice, the voice of the person, and, and, uh, and also the whole idea of using an element of nonfiction yes. uh, as much as fiction mm. in the writing of the book. Mm. Um, I know when I was doing, Anil, uh, when I was doing um, Running in the Family, I was writing about my family. This is, this is more memoir. And I was trying to write about my grandmother quite a bit. And then there was a wonderful actress who was then about 80 years old called Chandi Midenia in Sri Lanka. And she said, let me tell you about your mother, uh, your grandmother. This is how she spoke. And she just talked for about five minutes. It wasn't about what she was saying, but the yeah. way she spoke. And mm. that helped me more than anything else mm. to depict the portrait of my grandmother in that mm. book. Uh, in the English patient, also in Anil's Ghost, uh, 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 it comes as a surprise to a reader how specific are the professions of the characters. And this is very much a part of them. And it's very much part of your work. There's something always a little bit arcane, uh, something. Uh, uh, about uh, what the characters are up to, and that is a different kind of entry into into the world, and that that is, uh, sets up a point of view. Yeah, I, I think that's a very important part for me in how you, you you draw a character. You know, I mean, for for years I read books about characters who seem to be nothing more than referred to as an English professor uh, yeah. somewhere, and and that was enough. You know, and there was no sense of actually being active in their career in some way, and. You know, I mean, as a writer, you're, you're writing with a pen and pen in a room totally alone, and so you want to kind of, you know, if your characters are, are more interesting, like Kip, who are dis yes. <laughs> diffusing bombs, or a bridge builder in, uh, mm. in another book, you know, I, I, you are participating. It's, it's almost like the writing becomes an activity like that. Yes. So but it, it really helps you. I mean, what I like about writing a book is, is the research. I mean, the act of research and discovering the world of Macedonians, you know, in, in The Skin of a Lion, or um, the, the Sikh soldier in um, English Patient. Mm -hmm. So uh, the profession and the work he or she does, all of that becomes part of the, and, and if the book progresses with that story of work. Mm -hmm. One of the most beautiful things in Anil's Ghost is that paragraph where, uh, uh, and what I like very much about your work is, uh, some people seem, uh, uh, because they're first seen through the point of view of another character, they're showing annoying that character, and so we register themselves, <laughs> we register them as somebody very small, insignificant, or boring. Mm. And slowly they begin to creep up on both the reader and the character, and one of those people is Sarat Diasena in Anil's Ghost, and mm. uh, we are not told a lot about him, and he says something very humdrum to Anil a few times. Yeah. And then suddenly we, uh, we are shown that uh, he's in love with artifacts and much more than with human beings. And he, he lives in a world that is not the social world of today, but an imagined world made up, uh, 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 recomposed only in his mind and nowhere else, of an, a, a city in ancient Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, so you are able to collapse uh, all sorts of times, in a, uh, uh, times and uh, imaginations mm -hmm. in, I into one story mm -hmm. then, isn't it, if you work like that? Yeah, I mean, I, again, that's, it's, it's that wonderful sense of discovery that a book has. I, I mean, as a reader, you want that sense of discovery. Mm -hmm. a, a, a door opens halfway through the book and you enter a totally surprising room you weren't expecting in the house of lit fiction. Mm. You know, so definitely, I mean, I, partly because I didn't know much about Sarat at the beginning, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm sort of within uh, Anil's mind as she comes to Colombo and then she meets this guy and he says the usual, you know, um, nonsensical things or something like that. And then he becomes more and more complex. And then you discover his brother who is just as complex. Mm. And he hasn't even talked about his brother mm. for, 150 pages, so why did he not talk about his brother? So all, yes. all of that becomes about how people coexist and you know, try to separate themselves from coexisting. Mm. Why is violence so fascinating to you? Uh, because uh, mm. in both the English Patient and Anil's Coast, uh, there are these, um, uh, uh, your images are very powerful and uh, what you see is, uh, uh, for instance, there's this uh, moment which I don't think is meant to be absolutely comic when uh, one of the um, dissection students asks Anil as soon as, as soon as she's a corpse for the first time, is this your first corpse? Mm. And in some other writers that would seem like, you know, you're just playing the moment for comedy, but in this yeah. case there's something else going on over right. there. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I mean, um, both, well, especially in Anil's Ghost, you're dealing with a, a world that was exceedingly violent, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's very difficult to, I mean, I have a real problem writing about violence. I, I don't like writing about violence, and, and, 
I think that in some books there is a pornography of violence. Yes. And, and I, I find that truly disturbing, which seems to be there for the sake of shocking someone or you mm. know, inflicting something on not just the characters but onto the reader. Mm. And I, I think I, d I just didn't want to deal with it in that, in that kind of way. And yes. I think what was interesting was that almost unconsciously I chose Anil to have a profession of, a, of being a forensic anthropologist. Mm. So you do not witness the act of killing, but it's the w you witness the act of discovering how yes. that person was killed mm. or how that person was injured. Mm. And I mean, I was totally unaware of that, but I realized about three quarters of the way through that that, that was why I had somehow chosen that profession. Mm. Not to protect me, but also to protect yes. the reader from that, yes, that yes. pornography, you know. Very fascinating. So. Where did you, I noticed, I, uh, uh, I have to confess, and this will be true for other readers as well, we also like reading acknowledgments, not because of the people who are thanked, but of the uh, books and treatises that come up, uh, which you seem to have referred to. And there's the uh, 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 stuff about uh, the Royal uh, Geographical Society and bomb making in the English patient, and uh, some uh, uh, acknowledgments of essays on ancient hospitals in Sri Lanka yeah. in uh, Anil's goes. Well, does one know that one's, uh, can one trust that one will always find these sources? Or uh, when I'm researching the yes, book, you mean? Yeah. No, I mean, again, it's accidental. I mean, I. I, I I mean, I was just looking at the book today, and there was a whole thing about the Jaipur boot, which I totally forgotten I'd written about, which was, you know, when, because of the, the damage that was done by landing, landing on landmines, they had to create, you know, um, rebuild feet, and that the Jaipur boot was only, you know, much, much less money than the, the Western one, because people did not wear boots, they wore sandals, and it was, you know, yes. easier. Mm. So that kind of information is, at the time you're researching this, it's so kind of interesting to, I mean, the complexity of the real world, which we are unaware of, to do with landmines, for instance, or yes. whatever it is, mm. uh, or how, how um, you know, tr um, Indian troops were kind of had had chalk marks on their back when they, all of this was actually true stuff, you mm. know. Mm. So that uh, you are kind of, you are kind of, as I said the other day, that there is a kind of archaeology of, you know discovery of the real world which you did not know about until mm. you began to research this book and write the book. And I sort of do the writing simultaneously with the research. I don't research for five years and then write the book. Mm. You know, so it's, it's, it's very immediate. Mm. You came to novels uh, having already published uh, quite a bit of poetry. And it seems to me you bring to prose and uh, you have enriched novelistic prose uh, by bringing to it uh, um, the main uh, discovery of lyric poetry, which is that uh, everyday life is exceedingly mysterious, mysterious once you can d re uh, train your senses to notice everything, because there's so much essential uh, se sense impression in the world mm -hmm. that slowly it becomes banal for us. Mm -hmm. And reading your books, this is one of the great pleasures. You don't read them necessarily for the plot, but for things that appear uh, out of commonplace experience. Yeah, well, I, I hope they read them for the plot as well, but um, I, I think certainly, I mean, you're, you're you're, you're a, the, the voice of the, whoever was speaking at that time, the most important thing is to, to notice. Mm. To, you're a yes. notice of, notice of uh, mm. whatever the term is. Mm. And uh, you know, I think that, that's the kind of, uh, I mean, uh, to describe something bluntly doesn't work. I mean, when Kip is diffusing a bomb in The English Patient, um, he could just describe this nut and that nut and that fuse and this wire, but he's, angry about something. He's, he's angry about what has happened to Lord Suffolk. He's, you know, the, the, the emotions are, we are seeing that kind of depiction of bomb disposal through an emotion. And that, that changes the thing completely. Otherwise, it'd just be kind of, you know, the usual thriller. If in writing fiction, one has a particular method, sometimes very individual to oneself, what are the little steps one needs to take in one's own work to stop it from collapsing into mannerism? Uh-huh. Well, I, I think I, I'm, I'm, I would hate that to be true of me. I mean, I'm sure there are manner, mannerisms in, in my work, and people can, and they, an, an outsider can recognize it much better than I can. They're probably the same old, same old, you know, love scenes and so forth. Um, I, I guess, you know, in a way, partly because my own life has been nomadic, I think the, the, the writing has been nomadic. You know, I'm writing about... Uh, my first poems were about Sri Lanka, and then I wrote about a jazz musician in New Orleans, and then I wrote about 
you know, um, workers in Toronto in the 1920s, and then I wrote, you know, um, English patients. So I mean, the, the going to different locations and different situations, perhaps lets you escape that habit. Um, it doesn't always, obviously. It's always the same story. But you know, I think. I try to make that distinction. I mean, the reason I asked you that is uh, I was interested also to know uh, when you cut, uh, uh, how do you judge what needs to be cut out when uh, out of books such as yours? Um, that's more a question of pace. You know, I mean, I'm I'm one of those writers who, as I said the other day, I I write by hand, and um, the first draft is written now without this great theme or or plan, a, a theme tends to kind of run out after two pages anyway. Mm -hmm. So the, I don't have the theme in any way. I have, a, I have a curiosity about this character or these two characters and I, and I follow that path and gradually other people come into it and the, the whole story gets built up. So then after that first draft, I just go back and, and rewrite. I, I, I do many, many, many drafts of the book by hand and then put it onto a computer and then carry on that way. And what you're taking out is what doesn't interest you anymore for me. No, I could have written a whole section about this, and it just slows down the story. I mean, th this new book that's coming out had a whole section about the Janta Manta, you know, which I <laughs> went to when I was here five years ago, and I thought, yeah, it doesn't really work in this book. I love it, but I have to take it out. So, you know, you have to take out your your darlings, you know. But um, I, I don't know. It, it just, it, you know, it, it is more a case of pacing. You know, it is it's removing things, but then you have to add things so that they will mm -hmm. make the reader less lost in the story. You know, and then, then there are echoes of phrases that you can take out. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the art of editing. I mean, I spend so much time in editing. I'm, I probably enjoy that more than the actual first draft mm -hmm. because the first draft you don't know what the hell's happening, mm -hmm. but then later on you do know, so you can see it from another angle. Actually, one of the first books of uh, yours that I read was one in which somebody else had a much bigger place than you, and it was uh, The Art of Editing with Walter Murch. Mm. Uh, so this is the legendary film editor whom you met uh, fortuitously during the um, English, uh, patient. English Patient, yeah. and then you said about uh, transcribing some interviews with him. It seemed to me that you had kind of met your alter ego in the world of film. He, yeah, he's a very articulate alter ego. I mean, Walter Murch can talk, you know, legs of a donkey, you know, I mean, you can ask him about bees and he will talk about bees. I mean, he, he's very articulate. I mean, if, if you think of Francis Ford Coppola as the artist, uh, Walter is the emanuensis. He's the guy who knows exactly what um, Coppola should be doing and he's very, very articulate about why a scene is not working yet until, I, he, until he fixes it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, I mean, I have always been interested in editing because I edited a couple of documentary films, so I was fascinated to meet him, and he, because he's so articulate, and because he's been involved with some of these great films, that um, you know he can he can give examples of this where where things can be saved, you know. And so that how you save a book is also very important to me. <laughs> you know? yeah, right. Mm. Do you want to read a bit from one of your books, maybe Anil's course? Yeah. Um, let me just find this. There's a character called Garmini in Anil's Ghost, who is Sarath's brother. And he's a doctor. Sorry. And he's a doctor um, uh, in the north central province. And he's a young man. And he's someone who, again, is a bit of a mystery to us when we first see him. And he and his brother don't get on very well, but he's a doctor. In the operating rooms of the base hospital in the north central province, there were always four books in evidence. Hammond's analysis of consecutive penetrating wounds of the brain, gunshot wounds, arterial repair. In the doctor's common room in the north central province, someone had left a copy of elective affinities. The buildings that made up the hospital had been erected in the turn of the century. It had been managed in a lackadaisical manner before the exaggeration of war. In the grass courtyard, signs from a more innocent time would last throughout the waves of violence. Hafted soldiers who wished for sun and fresh air rested there and ate morphine tablets beside a beetle chewing is prohibited sign. 
The victims had started appearing in March 1984. They were nearly all male in their 20s, damaged by mines, grenades, mortar shells. The hospital would run out of painkillers pain during the first week of any offensive, and you were without self in those times, lost among the screaming. You held on to any kind of order, the smell of Savlon antiseptic that was used to wash floors and walls, the children's injection room with its nursery murals, the older purpose of the hospital continued alongside the war. When the young Dr. Garmini finished surgery in the middle of the night, he walked through the compound into the east buildings where the sick children were. The mothers were always there, sitting on stools. They rested their upper torso and head on their child's bed and slept, holding the small hands. There were not too many fathers around then, he watched the children who were unaware of their parents' arms. Fifty yards away in emergency, he had heard grown men scream for their mothers as they were dying. Wait for me, I know you are here. This was when he stopped believing in man's role on earth. He turned away from every person who stood up for a war, or the principle of one's land, or pride of ownership, or even personal rights. All of those motives ended up somehow in the arms of careless power. One was no worse and no better than the enemy. He believed only in the mothers sleeping against their children, the great sexuality of spirit in them, the sexuality of care, so the children would be comf confident and safe during the night. Ten beds skirted the edge of the room, and in the center was the nurse's desk. Garmini loved the order of these closed wards. If he, had a, if he had a few hours free, he avoided the doctor's dormitory and came here to lie on one of the empty beds so that even if he could not sleep, he was surrounded by something he would find somewhere else in the country. He wanted a mother's arm to hold him firm on the bed, to lie across his ribcage, to bring a cool washcloth to his face. He would turn to watch a child with jaundice bathed in pale blue light as if with an diorama, a blue light that was warm rather than clear with a specific frequency. Garmini wished to be bathed in it. Michael, are you one of those writers who when he reads his own work, likes what he sees? Uh, I, I haven't read my books much, hardly at all, since I wrote them. You uh -huh. know, I, I, I think what happens in the last stages of a book, I, I'm, I'm so obsessive, I drive people crazy, first of all, but I have to reread and reread and reread and, until there's some kind of blip of, you know, the pacing is wrong or mm. the word is wrong, and I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Mm. So that I think I know those books completely in that last three weeks before the book goes in. Mm. And I've never really read any of those books since. Actually, the only one I have read is Anil's Ghost. I had to read, I was doing something in the States, and I was invited there to talk about a specific book, and I hadn't read the book for about 20 years, so I thought I'd better read it. And so I did, but that's the only one of my books I've read. I haven't read The English Patient or any of those books since then. Mm -hmm. So I, the reason I don't read them is I'm worried, what if they're wrong, you know? <laughs> what if, you know, there's a whole section that shouldn't be there, or the whole section that should be there. But uh, on, uh, in the same token, what if they're right? That would be tremendously thrilling to see that. What? If I sh on, on reading them again and you found They're okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Anil's course was interesting to me. I was, I was sort of surprised by the research I did, actually. <laughs> I was kind of proud, proud of it, you know. Yes. I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff about, you know, about skeletons and how you, how you can tell their ages and stuff like that. I'd totally forgotten. Mm. But I also liked, the odd thing I liked was I liked the, dialogue, it didn't sound North American. Mm. It sounded more Sri Lankan. Mm. And I was glad to have caught that side of it, you know. Mm. But also, I, you know, there, there were a couple of things I, I probably would have dropped, but not, not that much, yeah. Mm. It seems to me uh, when um, one's as focused on writing as, as you are, and as many writers are, when you read older books of yourself, you also, uh, uh, connect back to yourself of yours you had forgotten. In a way, it's, uh, it's not just that we write our books, our books also write us. 
utterly. Yeah, I, I think this is, I mean, I would say, I would say that certain, you know, every book I wrote is like a time capsule of what I thought about for five yes. years when yeah. I was writing it. Even the jokes I was told five years ago somehow come into the book. Yes. You know, or a, a thematic sense or a, a political belief or a anti-political belief, whatever it is. Mm. And so that's kind of interesting, but I haven't really gone back and studied this, you know. Mm. Some uh, readers have called your books experimental, but I know that you think uh, it's not so much that you are so experimental as that many novels are too conventional. And it seems there's something, uh, there's something about realism and what it achieved, the, uh, um, the, the, the 19th century novel, that somehow it uh, uh, covered so much ground that it's, much too, it's too easy to repeat the conventions, so much so that anything that doesn't then seems very radical by comparison. Mm. Well, I, I think that, that I'm not sure if I'm so critical of the 19th century as that. Mm. It's just that I think I, I came, to po uh, came to fiction through poetry. Yes. So, I mean, poetry is about leaping. Mm. You know, it's not kind of crawling through mud to the next field. You know, yes. it's, it's leaping, leaping over the fence and so forth. So there's a jump, there's a jump the way, mm. you know, um, someone like uh, Truffaut or, or Godard jumped yes. in, in films at the time so that you know, it's, it's a quicker pace. You don't, you don't have to cross every bridge to get to the cathedral, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a, th there's a faster pace, but I also I think what I like about fiction is that it, it's, it can include um, nonfiction. Yeah. It can include poetry. It can include whatever it is. It can have the, the, the style of poetry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's, it's more of an entertainment. Like the Bible is entertaining, you know. Yeah. The Bible has every kind of possible form of writing in it. Yeah. Um, and I, I just find that, you know, keeps me on, on edge, you know, and, and I, I, I like that element. I mean, I also do like reading, you know, older books. You know, someone was talking about um, The Prisoner of Zender earlier on, which I, you know, was a book I grew up reading, uh -huh, you know. Yes. And we all have these kind of classic, you know, plots of adventure that we all read as teenagers, you know, and so that I love that too, and I want that there, there in the book as well. Mm. Uh, you said that uh, um, a part of your fictional ethic or poetics is derived from the fact that you have been nomadic, but surely this is something that you've chosen for yourself. It's not completely an accident. Perhaps a childhood was that you grew up in Sri Lanka and went to England and landed up in Canada. But after that, you have like, you, uh, you seem to be one of those people who knows that he goes to a new place, that's where a new book is born, not necessarily in the same, same territory as the past one. No, I, I don't necessarily go to a new place and then expect I will write about it. You know, I mean, I, I when I wrote Coming through Storter, which is a book about jazz, I'd never been to New Orleans. Mm. I, I'd never been to New Mexico when I wrote The Collector Works of Billy the Kid. Mm. But it was like a mental landscape in my head mm. that I, and a situation that I was interested in. Mm. I did go to New Orleans. I did go in the end, mm. while I was writing it, to the library at mm. Tulane and found out all kinds of data, which mm. somehow comes into the book as well. Mm. Um, it, I, I don't choose a place to write about because I've been there at right. all. It, it's yes. just something about it. I mean, I was interested in Buddy Bolden. I, I, was, I remember I was in, in London, Ontario, of all places, and I read about Buddy Bolden who had got, gone mad in a parade. And that mm. seemed to me such a kind of a strange thing to go mad in a very public place. Mm. And, and that really started me writing the book. You know? mm. So it could be something as small as that. Mm that uh, maybe do that. Mm. Uh, you said you're a writer partly because of the pleasure you get from reading, and I wondered if this is part of uh, writing itself, that before you write, you have to read, uh, whenever you get to work, even at your desk. And who among your contemporaries in the last 30 years have you read with the greatest pleasure? These are one of those questions where you always forget everyone you've read. <laughs> um, Mm. But I, I don't think, you know, the strange thing is that when I'm writing, I, I read much less. Mm. You know, I, I, I can't, especially I can't read anyone within my sphere yes. or my, among my contemporaries. I have to go and read some horrible racist John Buchan novel or something like that. You know, I mean, it's, it's absurd, but, or, you know, um, The Prisoner of Zender. I'll go mm. and read that again. Mm -hmm. um, and, or, but, but, but I... I so, but, but there certainly are writers who are important to me, but when I read them, I'm not thinking about, you know, what I can learn from them. You know, I mean, I like, say, Don DeLillo, I like um, various writers, but, you know, I'm, I'm more poets than um, novelists, I guess, too. Mm -hmm. um, there's a poet named Alice Oswald in, in England who wrote a book called Memorial, which is a fantastic 
poem about the Trojan War, mm. which is just magnificent, mm. you know. And uh, it could be a, a book, like a Simenon book mm. called the, the Train, which I'd never read till recently. Mm. So, the, you know, it's always this kind of, you, you like to find strange books that are, are sort of been left on the shelf mm. that should be become mm. famous and, and great. Mm. That, you know, the trouble is there's so much writing that today yes. you can't even find the, you have to find the good books with great care. Mm. Uh, wh- uh, I have always found uh, that one of the difficult things about uh, being nomadic is the problem of carrying a library around with you. And I wonder if, uh, in, but the uh, reverse of this is that when one, uh, for instance, when I went to Vietnam last year for 10 days, I thought this could be a, a way to uh, travel only with one book, so one's left with no choice but to read that. And I took along The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And it was one of the greatest uh, uh, travel uh, uh, vacations in my life, partly because of the company I was keeping, which is very good quality, 18th yeah. century Scotsman. Yeah. Yeah. And so I wonder if the, the, there's something in that, uh, is there something, um, uh, w- what is your strategy, for instance, w- when you're here for 10 or 11 days? Mm. What have you brought with you, or do you, did you just think you'd find something in the festival? I, I brought a couple of, I, I'm, I'm supposed to put together an anthology of novellas. Mm. And I, I had made a rough list of them, and I, I kind of brought them, because also they're very small and light. Mm. Um, so I, b- I brought a book called The Rider on the Pale Horse, which the other white horse, which no one knows about. Mm. And or I brought Babette's Feast, which is only about 60 pages. Mm. You know, so I, I try and take light things with me, but then I can find them on the on a iPad too. So that's a bit different. Mm. Do you think writing is improved by having someone to talk to it about while one is doing it? Uh, that it uh. becomes more real to oneself when it becomes real to someone else. It does, okay, but for me, uh, in, a, in a rather perverse way, I'm exactly the opposite of that. I, I, when I'm writing a book, I'm so, I'm so fearful of influence or, or losing the, the, the point of view or something that I don't tell anyone what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So it, it's like even within my family, they don't know what the hell I'm doing. So uh, for five years, I'm this kind of weird guy upstairs, you know. And, but when I've taken it as far as I can go after the say three or four years, I then give it to, you know, people close to me, and, and, and that's, the, that's, that's the magic point. That's when you get their responses, which are, can be critical or positive, or, my God, you do acting like that, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm. And I think that, that is a, the, the key moment for, in a book for me. Mm. I mean, going out and selling it later on is a drag. Mm. But, you know, when you're finally talking to your friend and say, by the way, this is what I've been doing for three years, mm. And they say, oh, no, this is terrible. You can't, you can't have so many horses, mm. you know. So you have to take out the horses and put you know, something else in there. So there's a real pleasure in... You're talking about writing now. How can you, how can you fix this? Yes. This is like a Walter Murch editing a, a film mm. and saying, no, you can't have, cannot have all these scenes with, you know, um, other people in this scene. It should be just one person. Mm. So you strip it down to just one voice mm. or just one person in the room. Mm. So that part is, is, a, is a great pleasure for me. Are titles very important in novels, or is this, some, is this something one tacks on at the end? I think it's very important. I mean, it's, it's become very important today. You know, I mean, I think I, I've, I've met several uh, young writers here, in fact, who, who t- they've written a book and they have a title, but their agent thinks it's a bad a title, hmm. and so they have to kind of change it, which is, which is sort of uh, distressing. You know, I mean, I think the writer can choose his or her own title. Yes. But yeah, it, I, you worry about it while you're going through. I mean, when I wrote a book called De Visadero, I, I just used the title De Visadero as a kind of marker on my, uh, you know, as mm. a title. To, this is where the, the, the text was. And by the time the book was finished, I realized it was the only word I could use mm. <laughs> for a title because it suggested a then and a now and a, and a, a, a split city and so forth. Mm. But I, I do worry about the titles. I mean, I, and, and I have friends, and we talk about titles all the time, of course, you know. What do you do with all the material that you cut out? Is there a place where, uh, uh, and the other thing I was interested in is that when you type up your manuscripts, because uh, we had some correspondence before the uh, event, and you were the only one of all the writers I wrote to who sent in um, uh, yeah. drafts in handwriting. So uh, at what stage do you type all that up? Uh, this is a kind of almost another perverse example of what I do. Uh, I do about four or five draw- drafts by hand, uh-huh. and then I'm a very s- slow typist, and it would take me like a month or two, and I just don't 
feel that's fair. So what I do, I have a typist, and what I do is I read the text into a tape recorder with all the punctuation, which is like mad. Now, open quotes, hello, close quotes, Jack said, comma, uh -huh. you paragraph. You know? So after about a day or two, you, are, you start talking like that, comma, you know. Uh, it, it is a very stupid thing, and I'm sure th there are better ways to do it, but first of all, no one can read my handwriting, and so, um, you know, I, I have to do this, and then I, get a, uh, uh, then I get a basic text sort of thing typed out, and from then on, I do, you know, change, do, I, I then print it out, do, it, do corrections by hand, and then put it back on the computer as something typed. Mm -hmm. But I have to kind of work on a page to edit, just as I, I do to actually write the story. Mm -hmm. I do not recommend this system. It's uh, pretty bad. Okay, it is now time for you, comma, the audience, comma, to ask questions. Uh, uh, in the front row. Uh, you just confessed that your handwriting is bad. Um, as, a, as a poet, largely a poet, I would say, uh, one of the things that drive me is good poetry, and one of the writers I admire is yours. Um, but you did present handwriting as a book. Yes. Uh, which was remarkably well etched and beautifully done in cursives. Um, that came a long time after The Cinnamon Peeler, which was your previous mm. book of poetry. And you, you were writing fiction and nonfiction in between. Tell me, is it a sort of a bipolar situation when it comes to poetry and fiction? Because you have to give very definitive kind of thinking in writing spaces in your head to do one or the other. And the second thing is, it seems to me that when I read handwriting, you were almost like telling yourself and telling your reader that Sri Lanka is now emotionally and uh, uh, emotionally important as well as the fact that in terms of your memory, that's an important thing that you need to set up mm. on the page. I'm very curious to know that because I remember having review, reviewed the book for The Scotsman and I had my own take, but this is the first mm. time I have you in front of me. Um, I, I think it's a very, very, I don't know it's bipolar, but I think you know, the way I, I sit down to write poetry, I mean, I, I began as a poet. And I think I wrote poetry while I was writing my first novel, which was Coming Through Slaughter. And I, in that novel, I could, I could do both. I could be a bigamist, as it were. You know, I could write poetry and also work on this novel. And then the next book I, uh, novel I wrote was um, In the Skid of a Lion, which had about many, many people in it and covered about 20, 30 years. And it was so confusing and complicated that I could also write poetry. So I didn't write any poetry during in the skin of a lion, and then that leapt into English patient. So I didn't write poetry for a long, long time, say almost 10 years or so. So when I finished English patient, the first thing I wanted to do was to go back to poetry. And it was tough to go back to the, not to the same voice, but to the, 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 the intimate voice. I mean, I, I tried to take that intimate voice into my prose, for sure. Uh, but a, a novel is like theater, you know, it's like, Every, you have to be able to see everyone when they're speaking. You know, the, they have to be well lit and they have, have good sound and so forth. A poem could be whispering. So that, that's a distinction between those two. But certainly, when I went back to write handwriting, and I was also in Sri Lanka, you know, everything had changed. That was, you know, they'd been through this terrible war. And in many ways, handwriting was almost like a first draft of Anil's Ghost. You know, in, in, in many, many ways. You know, some of the... the the, the elements of archaeology you know, went next into the, the burial of bodies and the discovery of bodies and so forth. Um, you there and then you, Zach. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Hi. Um, I am intrigued to know that you are also a forensic anthropologist <laughs> since I'm, I was also a student of forensic science and anthropology. I would like to ask you that uh, how has your knowledge of uh, forensic anthropology influenced your uh, literary work? Okay, I have to confess I'm not a forensic anthropologist. I, I, I became a forensic anthropologist in, in the book Anil's Ghost, but I am not one. I'm a fake. Just as I am I haven't you know, diffused bombs or built bridges. You know, but that's 
uh, a craft I greatly admired. And so the, the char character of Anil is, is, is a forensic anthropologist in that book. So that's how it came to be. Sorry to disappoint you. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I would like to, you to talk a little bit about uh, running in the family because I, I mean it's a fantastic read, but um, and you refer to it as a memoir uh, now, and but I, I believe like your brother, for example, he was quite critical of like uh, it, I read somewhere that he said that it was not at all like this. Huh. So what is your like relationship to? actual people and facts when you write a book like that, which is sort of, it could be a novel, it could be a memoir. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, Anil's, uh, sorry, uh, Running Fam got called a memoir because, you know, that's the, the word of the day. I mean, uh, I always admit it, it's very, it's, it's very has, a, has as much fiction as fact. Uh, the thing is, when you're, if, I, if I write about my grandmother, uh, who lived till she was 80, but she only, she's only got 25 pages, you know, that becomes fiction because you, you, it's, her life is much more exciting than the 80-year-old life, you know, perhaps. So, I mean, um, it was the only book which, which I showed to people uh, before I published it. So I showed it to my family, I showed it to my uncles and aunts, and actually it was great to get some notes on that. Um, so that, uh, you know, I, it, it, I, I had more information as a result of that. You may. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Hi. I'm an actor and a producer and a huge, huge admirer of yours. I've actually stayed back. My sessions got over yesterday because I really wanted to hear you. Um, one question which always bothers me, both as an actor and also that I produce content now, when a book is turning into a film, there's a huge difference and a vast difference between a working script, a production script, and what is actually the written word. Right. So did you work closely with the team of this fantastic film, which turned into one of the most globally renowned films you know, of our times, uh, in, including the writing and the direction? Did you work closely with them? And are you open to ideas where a director who may acquire rights for a film for a, for, uh, for a film from a book that you've written, uh, wants to deviate a little from the narrative. I mean, would, do you think that's possible, or is it? Uh, I, I, I think it's very important to admit for a writer, if, if, if they're going to give their book to someone else to make a film out of it, it has to be made into a film as opposed to uh, an illustration of the book. I mean, some people have tried uh, um, adapting um, In the Skin of a Lion, and the scripts have always been illustrative, you know, I think the thing about Anthony Minghella was that he had, he had the wisdom to kind of deconstruct it and then begin again. I mean, not, if I had made the, written the film, it would have been different, but I mean, I totally respected what he was doing. And, you know, as, I think the filmmaking is completely different, you know, in a way, if you can summarize the English patient as a, as a book about a, a man who'd been badly burned in a bed with a sort of depressive nurse. That doesn't sound too exciting. But even, for instance, the way it was shot, in every scene that the patient was in the bed, he was always at, at some point of movement. So there was, it, he was a still, static figure. So that's a small technical detail about directing that keeps it active. And there are so many things about, I mean, I, I was very interested. I, I'm very interested in learning the craft of any art. So I kind of watched as much as I could of how they, sh directed it, how they edited it, how they shot it, all that stuff. So I, I think if you're, if you're going to give your book to somebody else, you have to admit that it, has to, it, it will be different. Um, I just have Where are you? I'm right, right here. here. Ah. Okay. So uh, in terms, of this follows up on her question in some way and what you were saying. Do you find as a writer of, you know, they're making a film out of your book, out of your writing, have you found that they welcome you on set, or would they just rather you not be there? I think in most cases they would rather I was not there. But I which was strangely, it was one of those magical moments where Saul Zanz, who was the producer, and Anthony Minghella were lovers of books, and we, we came very, very close. So we, I mean, I was invited on, you know, when, when Anthony was writing the screenplay, the first draft, he and I and Saul got together for three or four days and responded to it, and then 
the second draft, and then it went on from there. So we were the only three people who, who had seen it. It wasn't someone like Tom Cruise deciding he wanted to be in the movie or something like that and wanted a bigger part. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, it was a, a very loving and a very affectionate trio for a long time. And then Walter Murch came in and then various other people came in. So I, I would just add on to that briefly that several of my friends who are writers and their films get made in, their books get in, or scripts get into being made into a film, they're treated like really terribly. Nobody wants them I know, there. I know. I, I've heard that story, stories too, so I just, I don't want to go back into the profession because I was lucky the first time. You there and then we'll come to you in the front row. Thank you, Michael. Hi. You mentioned that you love poetry, and I wondered if there's any phrases of poems that you live by in your writing life. For instance, Rabindranath Tagore and his um, phrases about stringing and unstringing his instrument and the song he came to sing remains unsung. Yeah. I wonder if there's something you would share with us. I'm, I'm, I'm very bad at recalling things when I'm on stage. I'm sorry. <laughs> But I would say that poetry is very, very important to me, you know, um, and I, I probably read more poetry than fiction. You know, just as I read some, some non-fiction as much as um, fiction, in a way. So, but it, 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 the influences are so strange and so distant in some ways. It could be a, a phrase from 10 years ago or how someone broke a stanza or something like that. And, I'm, as I said, interested in, in the art of film or any kind of art, and I, I think I'm always, I, I think I want to kind of not steal, but learn from all the other arts, because arts like dance and song and whatever it is, greyhound racing, you know, seems uh, so much more active than writing. And they seem to be things that writing cannot do. So I try and drag it into the, of element of prose. Hi. Uh. Michael, good afternoon. I'm sorry to ask this question. It's an unfair question, but as someone who's read all your books, I want to know which is your favorite book. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't have a favorite book. I'm sorry. I, I, I wish I, I, I knew, but I, I don't have a favorite book. Hello. Sorry. So you mentioned that you were a kind of a, like a nomadic writer, and as a writer whose work is uh, often taught in different post-colonial uh, syllabi across the world, like how have the places that you've lived and the cultures that you've been exposed to impacted your writing? Like, has it changed your writing style, or do you find like you tackle different themes or topics depending on the places that you're living in or being affected by? Okay, so something like uh, I mean, I, I grew up in Sri Lanka. I was born there till I was 11. Then went to England. Then went to school in England. And, um, you know, so something like um, the, the, the jazz novel, either through research or through the imagination or, to, or through going to New Orleans, all of those things, the physical geography of New Orleans in, influenced me. And when I came back to Sri Lanka to write Running the Family, that also influenced me. And more so because suddenly you were in, within a dialect. You had sort of forgotten. There was a way of joking about things in Sri Lanka that wasn't anywhere else in the world, you know. So the, the humor in that book, or the way people talked, was the most important thing when I wrote that book. Because when I was growing up, I don't remember reading any books as a child. But I do remember that the, the dinner conversation was this wild theatrical event where people were lying and accusing each other of adultery and all kinds of things were going on. And, and I was just listening and listening and listening and, you know, to be a writer, you had to be a great listener. And so that, that kind of voice that was there in the dinner table and, and the Chandi Medenia story about my grandmother, the voice became the, the central influence of how a story was told. Am I missing anybody, someone from the back? <laughs> you there, yes. <laughs> All alone. It's all alone by. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question is quite related to Anil's quest. In Anil's quest, the main character's uh, main character Anil's name had not been always Anil. Um, Anil had given two names, but she did not like. Uh, even she refused to add an e at the end. 
what is the implication of renaming? Does it imply that she has created an identity for herself? I'm sorry, I don't know. Wh why is, does Anil have another name in Anil's course, and what is the implication of the fact that she's... Oh, okay, so uh, Anil, which is a man's name, is a name uh, that the female character uh, persuaded her brother to give her because she felt that was her, her right. It, it, it doesn't really mean anything apart from her, her just a desire to be called Anil. It doesn't, it's not a symbolic or religious anything at all. It's just, but I just, it sort of created a, a determination in this character that was unusual. And, you know, she's a very interesting but also difficult person. And um, so that seemed like a strange demand on her family, you know, she wouldn't answer anyone in the family when she was called by her real name. We have a couple of minutes, anyone else? Yes, in the front. Hi, um, I came to your work through uh, a poet, uh, Norma Cole's work. I think she quoted you in one of her books and I was wondering, um, what are the poets you're reading right now? Uh, well, I mentioned this book called Memorial, which is a, a really great book, I think, by um, Alice Oswald. And it, she, she takes, what she does is she writes about the death of very, very minor characters in the Iliad. And uh, it's such an unusual decision to write through that prism of that only. And, and each one gets about four lines. And the first two lines are usually some horrific way the person died. And then the next two lines are more uh, of a female recognition of his personality, like he was a man who always bathed his dogs on weekends, you know, so that kind of draft. And then you go through all these unknown lives who, who, who really do appear in the Iliad. And then the last one is Hector, who is famous, but it's just another death. It's a great book. Anybody else, last question? Yes, you have been waiting. Hello, thanks Michael. Um, I wonder whether you have a view on using first person versus third person, uh, any oh. pluses, minuses, and mm. your preferences. Thank right. you. That's an interesting question. I mean, I, I can't even remember what some of my books were written in, quite honestly, so far back. But uh, I think what's interesting, uh, like in, in, in The Skin of a Lion, you have a bridge builder named Nicholas Tamilkov, and he's quite heroic, he's, uh, how he builds the bridge, how he works on the bridge at night, falls with the ropes and all this stuff. And I realized when I was writing it, if that, was that, if that was in the first person, it would have been a boast. You know, and I, I suddenly realized that I, I could not have written this sequence you know, in the first person because it just wouldn't have worked. Whereas in the third person, it was, you know, oh, how wonderful, how wonderful. You know? And so it's always interested me about that. Um, but now the last two books I've done, uh, The Cat's Table was in the first person. And then this new one that's coming out in the spring is also in the first person, which kind of limits your heroism. Mm. But it makes it more, I mean, I, I just love the kind of intimacy of the first person, and, and especially the first person that doesn't reveal everything, so that the reader has to kind of find out what that thing is. And I'm interested, like in Cat's Table, it's about a young boy going from Sri Lanka to England by ship. And it's also about the boy later on becoming, you know, a writer. And um, I like the thing about having almost a child's voice of watching things as an 11-year-old, but also with a kind of adult's awareness of how other adults treat children or themselves. So that kind of double vision thing interests me a great deal. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that, uh, oh, uh, do we have, one yes, question. yes, yes, why not? I'm really sorry, sir, to delay you, <laughs> but I have one <laughs> question in my mind. Yeah. The, the readers, while reading your books, they undergo a gamut of emotions. Do you, while writing your book, do undergo any emotional swings or cry or are, or is angry with rage or uh, agitated or something like that? Yeah. I, or I, do you feel it more when you are writing as a first person narrative? So, what? 
do you feel this more, uh, more of emotions mm. while you are writing as a first-person mm. narrative? No, I, I think I feel the same, feel the same way with this third person or first person or whatever it is. Um, I don't, I don't cry and I don't laugh. I know, I know some writers talk about laughing while they're writing a funny story. I suspect they're not very funny stories. You know, I mean, because I mean, humor is almost accidental. You know, I mean, I, I've written scenes that turned out to be funny that I didn't know were funny when I was writing it. So emotionally, I'm very, I'm kind of totally caught up while I'm, I'm reading, writing the story, but I'm not thinking, am I hurt or damaged or whatever it is. I'm just trying to get it at be as truthful as I can about that person's viewpoint or response or emotion or fear, you know. So that, that extra element, the theatrical side, isn't there. Okay, friends, I know some of you have been waiting all festival for this hour with Michael, so I hope that it has been worth your time. And he will be around just after to sign copies of your uh, uh, Ondaatje book. So, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes. Can we please give them a big round of applause to Michael Ondaatje and Chandrahas Chaudhary. This session was sponsored by the Man Booker Prize. Both of them will be available at the book signing area. Grab your copies and they'll be signing the books.